the year is 1914. This nice and clean map of Europe has a lot more dirt than you might think it does, and it's only going to get messier from here. So what is going on now, what was going on before, and what is going to happen later? Spoilers, a fight breaks out and destroys a good chunk of everybody. So let's look back a little bit before the year 1914 and the year 1912. The region in Southeast Europe known as the Balkans was always a hot mess. Let's look at one kingdom here, Serbia. This one, as of now, fairly small kingdom has an undying urge to expand. When they failed in taking a region with a high population of Serbs, Bosnia, they looked south. And what is actually south of them? Just a ton of their Christian pals that are waiting to escape the Muslim Empire. This is the Ottoman Empire, who doesn't have a very good reputation with the rest of the gang here, so everybody has a little bit of a score to settle with them. The four kingdoms of Bulgaria, Greece, Serbia, and Montenegro band together, and the Balkan League is assembled, ready to take the Ottomans out of Europe, and on October of 1912, they begin their attack. To say the very least, this did not end well for the Ottomans. All four kingdoms took a nice chunk of land with them, and now there's an independent state, Albania. Even though massive gains were made on the Balkan League side, the largest and most powerful kingdom, Bulgaria, was not pleased with their share of a region known as Macedonia to the people who live there, and former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia to the people who don't live there. Bulgaria invades their former best friends in June of 1913. We will fight for this land that is rightfully ours, and we shall be remembered for it. Victory belongs to us, the people of Bulgaria. They failed and gave up in a month. So now we have a collapsing empire trying to survive. One kingdom displeased with their war profits. One kingdom attempting to unite all Serbs, but a bit north of them. A huge empire who is still holding Bosnia, full of Serbia's people. Everyone get mad, because Serbia isn't stopping. In late June of 1914, a Serbian nationalist by the name of Gavrilo Princip assassinated Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria. A month later, war breaks out between Austria, Hungary, and Serbia. Directly after, Russia declares war on Austria-Hungary for declaring war on Serbia. Afterwards, Germany declares war on Russia for declaring war on Austria-Hungary for declaring war on Serbia. Second to lastly, France declares war on Germany for declaring war on Russia for declaring war on Austria-Hungary for declaring war on Serbia. Now finally, UK declares war on Germany and Austria-Hungary because that's what friends do. So let's get started. France and Germany weren't at good terms even before this war began. As a result, their direct border was heavily guarded, but Germany didn't exactly plan on playing by the rules. Since going under, over, or through the border wasn't an effective option, why not just go around it? Following this train of thought is exactly what Germany did. In early August of 1914, Germany went on to attack through Luxembourg and Belgium in order to get to France. While their initial attack was effective, they stopped advancing by September and found themselves locked in a stalemate. Both sides dug trenches and stopped moving until late March of 1917. So as the British might say, let's skip across the pond for a moment to see how the US is doing. Attempting to stay neutral, they just see this war as a distant tragedy that shouldn't involve them in any way, but now they're feeling a bit bad for Belgium who got trampled on by German troops. Because of this, Herbert Hoover, who would later become the president of the US, organized the Commission for Relief in Belgium, where supplies needed for a living that generally most Belgians did not have at this point were brought to them. Other than this, however, the US was having a jolly okay time taking stuff over in the Pacific like the rest of the Europeans would have. So, with that being said, things in the Americas are pretty calm as of now. Now let's go back to Europe to look at Serbia and Austria-Hungary and what they're up to. Nothing. Nothing. For the first entire year of the war, very few advances had occurred between Serbia and Austria-Hungary. Even though these two were at each other's throats during the first couple of days, Austria-Hungary's priority changed quickly as Russia started gnawing on their eastern border. The front lines here were back and forth. Germany and Austria-Hungary only began making significant gains after a counteroffensive took place during May of 1915. Now, who are we forgetting about? The Ottomans, of course. Let's not forget about the Ottomans who joined the war on the 29th of October of 1914. They were just a tad late to the party, but they stayed up until the very end. Upon their arrival, they were met with a quick 2x4 to the back of their head, also known as an invasion. Whatever you want to call it, it was quickly repelled by mid-November. The Ottomans went a bit further and decided to attempt to invade Russia in mid-winter, but just like before, this attack was repelled the next month. The Ottomans were not entirely happy with this move. On top of an empire that is collapsing due to problems with ethnic diversity, now they have a bruised military force and can't fight as well on foreign soil. So, like any logical thinker of the 1480s, they walked right into ethnic Armenian territory and proceeded to <laughs> do things that would probably get my video blocked in modern day Turkey, thank you very much. Now as of May of 1915, let's take a look at the standings. Russia and the Ottomans are running into a stalemate, Serbia and Austria-Hungary are still at a stalemate, and Germany and France have not moved at all. But now Germany is advancing into Russian territory faster than before. Between May and October, Germany had entirely captured the Duchy of Warsaw and is making quick moves into Russia's Baltic holdings. 
Just as things have really started to heat up between Germany and Russia, Serbia is seeing their last couple of months in this war. On the other hand, the US is getting really mad about Germany sinking the favorite boat, the Lusitania. The US is starting to reconsider being neutral in this conflict, and this is about the second to last straw they can hold before it breaks their back. So you remember Bulgaria? Yeah, Bulgaria remembers Bulgaria. On October 14th of 1915, the previously mentioned Bulgaria, who was still disappointed about the outcome of the last Balkan War, decided to take the opportunity of seeing Serbia completely vulnerable and united in cooperation with Austria-Hungary. Within two months, Serbia was destroyed. Bulgaria made off with a good chunk of their land, but Serbia wasn't entirely finished. So I hope you were following before, because I'll warn you, it only gets more confusing from here on out. Within the last couple of days, Serbia's army evacuated into neighboring Albania and Greece, and continued fighting from there. So, with mainland Serbia defeated, the war should end, right? Well, unfortunately, no. Europe has already turned into a melting pot of chaos and they're not showing any sign of stopping. Everyone had done enough to piss each other off, it seems, and now they all have a score to settle. A score they can only settle with more- blood! A lot more blood is to be bled, so let's keep bleeding, shall we? Ever since the defeat of Serbia, things have slowed down until April when Russia decided to drop a few more 2x4s on the Ottomans' heads. And then in June, Russia took back land from the Germans. Making a bit of a comeback, Romania joined the Allies in late August of 1916 and invaded Austria-Hungary. It went nicely until September when Bulgaria attacked from the south, diverting Romania's attention. Romania was fought out of Austria-Hungary through October, and through the next three months, it proceeded to be steamrolled. So besides Romania being steamrolled, and the fact that this is a war, of course, things are actually getting pretty quiet. This relative silence would all be ruined when Germany decided to poke the US with a stick once again. On January 19th of 1917, Germany attempted to send a telegram to Mexico, but the message was intercepted by the UK and was forwarded to the US. This was known as the Zimmerman Telegram. Germany, who was afraid of the US becoming too powerful, wanted something to distract the US from Europe. In this telegram, Germany essentially said, Hey Mexico, if you want to help me destroy the US, I'll help you get your land back from that war you had. Of course, Mexico's never getting a say in this, since the US received the telegram before Mexico did. Too bad for Germany, who is trying to reach out to make a new friend, because after receiving this telegram, the United States declared war on Germany. So now while the US is gearing up for battle, Europe is just now thawing out from doing pretty much nothing all winter. The action would kick start after France won the Battle of Verdun, 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 Verdois, and began making gains against the Germans in March, but after a short time, they got stuck again. Much more drawn out mustard gas attacks, trench foot, massacres, and vomiting ensues throughout the entire year. Fast forward to November of 1917, and Russia spontaneously has a revolution. There's communists now, and they want to overthrow the Russian government. Now Russia has to fight the Ottomans, Austria-Hungary, Germany, and now they have to fight themselves too. Of course, nobody can fight in Siberia except for Russia during the winter, but Russia's already fighting with Russia, so obviously Russia does not stand a chance. In December, Russia capitulates. They pull out of the war, but they end up paying a massive exit fee. Signing the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, Russia loses Ukraine, Estonia, Latvia, Livonia, Lithuania, Finland, Poland, Belarus, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, 25% of their population, 90% of their coal industry, and they pay 6 million German marks for damages. Quickly, Germany, Austria-Hungary, and the Ottomans rush in to occupy the surrendered territories. Even though Russia as a whole had already surrendered, these territories were still not entirely calmed down since the surrender, and small battles would still be taking place. As a result, it took most of the Central Powers' troops to secure this land. Because of this, they were even weaker on every other active front. If you think this would make the US think twice about trying to fight Germany, who just capitulated a giant bear not long ago, then you would be wrong. In January of 1918, the US President Woodrow Wilson outlines what is called the 14 Points, a set of principles that could be put into place after the war to ensure peace will remain in Europe and that further conflict over basically the same things would be avoided. Simplified, they are as followed. Section 1. There will be no secret treaties. If two or more countries have to agree to something, you bet everybody else is going to know they agreed to it. Section 2. Freedom of access to the sea, whether during times of peace or times of war. Essentially, this is a discreet way of telling Germany that sinking everybody's boats in international water was not a very nice thing to do. Section 3. The establishment of free trade. You can probably imagine that people would stop selling guns to each other if they knew that the buyer was going to use the guns on them. The economic immobility that took place during World War I also restricted a lot of trade of food. Because of this, there is a pretty significant famine. Everywhere. Section 4. The provokers of this war will have their armies dulled down to use defense forces. 
Of course, it isn't totally necessary to spend more than 10% of your entire gross domestic product just to build more killing machines, right? Section 5. The Empire's colonial claims will be adjusted, or in other terms, the Allies are going to take the Central Powers colonies for themselves. These will be administered in what are called mandates later. Section 6. The Russian territories will be evacuated, and afterwards, everyone will let Russia decide their own fate in the ongoing civil war. Unfortunately. Section 7. Germany, seriously, get out of Belgium, that's illegal. Section 8. Germany should probably also get out of France. About 50 years prior to this war, Germany had taken over Alsace-Lorraine. France was mad and so was everybody else, apparently. Section 9, Italy will be adjusted so that anyone deemed an Italian would be within their borders. This mainly concerns Austria-Hungary, but surprisingly not San Marino. Section 10, Austria-Hungary, the beautiful patchwork of different languages and ethnicities, is to let all these other ethnicities decide what they want to do for themselves. Or in freedom terms, we'll give them independence. Section 11, Romania, Serbia, and Montenegro are to be got out of by the Central Powers and have their stolen territories given back to them. Serbia will be given free, undisturbed access to the sea, Balkans will be organized along lines of national allegiance, and independence will be guaranteed for all of them. Nice job. Section 12, the Ottoman Empire will be partitioned along lines of ethnicity. The Turkish majority portion will be given independence as its own Turkish nation, while other ethnicities will be given the right to decide to rule amongst themselves. Just like Kurdistan, I'm sure. This section also promises that the Turkish Straits will be internationally administered and will be open to anybody sailing through. Section 13. A Polish state will be given independence in areas that are undeniably majority Polish. They will also be given access to the sea and a promise of undisturbed independence. Oh, if only they could predict the future. And finally, Section 14, the League of Nations will be formed as an organization made up of great powers who will assure that everyone will be able to maintain their independence and that generally stuff gets enforced. Even though the United States has made a pretty confident statement about the future of the world, the Central Powers still kept at it. After spending most of 1918 trying to secure the land that fell off the Russian Empire, the US had already deployed to France and began driving the Germans out. On the last day of September 1918, Bulgaria surrenders. On the last day of October of the same year, and the Ottomans lay down their arms. The 3rd of November, and austria hungary recoils in fear as they are attacked from all sides. And of November 11th, Germany is finished. And thus, a victory was secured for the Allies. Surely this can't be the end, can it? Do not worry, because at least 17 million people did not die for no reason. The world is going to look a whole lot different from now on. So now let's look at how Europe will be reshaped. First we'll look at Austria-Hungary, which went from a beautiful stained glass window to a harmful, bloody, and ugly pointy mess of broken glass. First of all, the land that's inhabited by Czechs and Slovaks is given independence, forming Czechoslovakia. Second, Serbia and Montenegro unite, and further annex what is known today as Bosnia, Croatia, Slovenia, and Vojvodina. this thing, to form what is familiar to many as the Kingdom of Yugoslavia. Trentino was ceded to Italy, of course, because it's pretty easy to deem the people there Italians. Transylvania was ceded to Romania, and from then on, vampires became a Romanian stereotype again. Galicia, which is inhabited by many Poles, was ceded to the not-yet-complete Polish Republic. Finally, of course, the kingdoms of Austria and Hungary are now two separate entities. Now into Bulgaria, they were able to hold on to their Serbian land for the duration of the war, but now they're forced to give it back. To Greece, they lost their direct access to the Aegean Sea. They were also required to shrink their absurdly large military down to a size of just 20,000 men, and pay for the, all the stuff they broke. And yes, they did break Serbia. So guess who's getting all the money? The Ottomans' fate was not entirely sealed until a few years after the war. An Armenian state was given independence, while Egypt, Palestine, Jordan, Iraq, and Kuwait were given to the British, and Lebanon and Syria were given to the French. Greece, France, the UK, and Armenia attempted to wrestle down the Ottomans for the next couple of years until they eventually settled and formed the modern-day Turkey. And for whatever reason, there's still no Kurdistan. Quick fun fact, it was proposed to see Armenia to the United States as a mandate, but this idea was denied by the Senate. All for the sake of democracy, I suppose. And now for Germany, who for whatever reason everybody thinks started the war. Their Polish land, of course, is given to the newly established Polish state. Poland is also given access to the sea through the Polish corridor. This, among many other things, becomes very controversial later. Some land a bit south of this is ceded to Czechoslovakia, who also really recently emerged. The region of Alsace-Lorraine is returned to France after it was taken from them in an earlier conflict. Germany also ceded Memel to France, a region near Lithuania, but later on, Lithuania took it from them because it makes sense. To Denmark, northern Schleswig was ceded, despite them not doing much the entire time. The city of Danzig, near East Prussia, was given independence as a free city-state. To Belgium, who so sadly stepped on, received the regions of Eupen and Malmedy, and we're still not done. 
Far away across the ocean, or more specifically in Africa, the German colonies of Tanzania and Namibia are both given to Britain, Cameroon and Togo were split between the France and the UK, and the regions that are today known as Rwanda and Burundi were given to Belgium. But I'm still not done! In the Pacific, Japan, who honestly was just here to make a profit, gains Germany's Pacific holdings above the equator, plus a small colony that used to be part of China. German Samoa was given to New Zealand, who at the time was still under British control, and the rest was given to Australia, who was also a British subject. Back into Europe for a moment, Germany's military was stripped of all things unnecessary for defending themselves. They were also required to remove military presence from the area west of the Rhine River. The area captured from what used to be the Russian Empire was to be returned, but since Russia doesn't exactly exist right now, the areas are evacuated and eventually chaos sweeps back into them. Finally, the last salt covered nail in the open wooden coffin, Germany is now required to pay 132 billion marks, which in today's money is about 442 billion dollars. Even though the treaties were set in stone and managed to please most of the Allies, there are still millions of people who are overall not happy since the conclusion of the war. Bulgaria lost even more, Germany had fallen, and now Austria and Hungary are weakened on their own. But even then, Italy still is a bit picky with what they earned after fighting. Soon enough, someone way too out of his mind is going to show up and try to recreate the Roman Empire. This was a very controversial treaty, and if you can't tell, Germany lost a bit too much for their own good. Their economy falls, and the German people are now angrier than ever before. They are starting to feel separated from each other after losing swaths of land. As the years progress through the quite literally depressing interwar period, Germany seeks to restore its glory. We'll give Europe until the 1930s before some Austrian painter comes to power and decides to make his dream come true. Until then, enjoy how relatively clean this map of Europe looks. It'll get even messier in the next 20 to 30 years. So what lesson can we even learn from this? We cannot pin the blame on just one side exactly, and it's not like there is an obvious bad guys and good guys, at least not in continental Europe. Rather, the blame will be pinned on the main causes. M standing for militarism. Everyone was militarized, let's be honest. Everyone constantly had their armies fully armed and ready, and were about ready to snap at each other at any moment. A standing for alliances. Regardless of whether or not people thought assassinating Archduke Franz Ferdinand was such a brilliant idea, Russia only came to Serbia's aid because they had already established that they were good friends with each other. It isn't like Germany hated anybody either, they had only decided they needed to support Austria-Hungary because they had made an alliance with them. I standing for imperialism. Europe was getting crowded, but everyone still wanted to take stuff over. This applied to everyone. Italy liked taking over the Mediterranean, France and Britain liked taking over Africa, Serbia liked taking over other Serbs, and so did Bulgaria. Everyone was bound to take over something at some point. And standing for nationalism. Mostly this can be traced back to the one guy Gavril Princip. He had the plan to make a point of uniting all the Serbs by killing Franz Ferdinand, but of course, Bulgaria had essentially the same idea in mind, which is what drove them to beat the tar out of Serbia. Now that we know that not one side in particular was to blame for these four years of everybody dying, is there still any lesson we can learn besides overall not being a militarized, allied, imperialist nationalist? Well, there is one, and it applies anywhere. Just stop killing each other, it helps!